Welcome to Mentoring Moments. Mentoring Moments is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast. It is composed of clips taken from Jason's one-to-one and group mentorship sessions. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. I've got another winning episode lined up for you today. It is my pleasure to welcome Elizabeth Green, the co-founder of Jungler, to the pod. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Nah, man, it's awesome to have you along for the ride today. I was saying that clearly this is not your first rodeo because you have the full-on setup with the, the headset and the mic and the background and everything. You must do this podcast thing a fair bit, do you? Yeah, podcasts have been great for me. It was funny. I recently did like a workshop talking about just like the OG days then till now. And I, with that, I had some of my team pull my first podcast and I look at it and I'm like cringe. I'm like, oh my God, it looked like I don't want to be there. Like stone face, all the background's terrible. Mike was whatever. Yeah, it, it's been a minute. Probably doing podcasts for about four years now off and on. So Wow. Wow. You seem like a natural. And when we were talking about off air, what you guys do and how even the domain name Jungler came along, it's all related to Amazon, isn't it? It is. We got started to, for context, the the business is to offer Amazon advertising management support to sellers who sell on the platform. So that's my domain, my area of expertise. I was telling you, like watching past episodes, I'm like, man, I can learn a lot from, you know, your podcast and the guests that you have on because I I definitely have like very specific domain expertise. So I love being on podcasts like this or educating myself with podcasts like yours to be able to like expand my knowledge base and then branch out from there. But yeah very much got started in that specific niche in an industry and have stayed there. Obviously, I like to keep an ear to the ground. I feel like at some point we're really, that's the name of the game, growth. With growth comes expansion, but it's been going on about seven years now, still, at least in terms of service offering, sticking to that area of expertise, which I think has allowed us to go really deep, which has been good. Which is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the podcast as a guest mentor, because you specialize in an area that I know so little about. I've had a few Amazon experts on the podcast over the last few years, but Amazon is really, for me and someone like me who has ne- I've never sold on Amazon before. As I was telling you off air, I've spent an ungodly amount of money on Amazon as a shopper on Amazon, particularly now we're about ready to move into a new townhouse here in Mexico and the amount of stuff I've had to buy through Amazon to kit out our house over the last couple <laughs> of months has been a little bit crazy. And they're one of the most trusted sources of products in e-commerce in the whole of Mexico. Them and Mercado Libre and Koppel, they're the big three from a marketplace mm-hmm. perspective, and they're absolutely crushing it here. And you can see why the level of communication they provide, the level of certainty that, that they provide, the range that they provide, the pricing they provide. Amazon is just a killer opportunity as a customer and so i can imagine it's a pretty killer opportunity as a seller too as a result but amazon is seen by many as a frenemy right they're they're a must-have channel because they drive so much demand through their channel but then again a lot of brands are worried about amazon selling against them whether it be in a 1p or a 3p scenario and so i think there's a lot of misunderstanding of amazon out there and i think there's also particularly a lack of education, knowledge, experience maybe out there uh, around Amazon ads specifically, which is where you specialize, because I think that a, a lot of brands don't realize that now Amazon, the Amazon ad platform is the number three ad platform in the United States between mm-hmm. Meta behind Meta and Google, and it feels a little bit like they came out of nowhere, but considering the fact you've been doing this for seven years, clearly that's not the case. Yeah, the Amazon platform goes way back even before I started. It is interesting. So in my industry, one of the things I like to keep an ear to the ground is Google ads because for context, the area of Amazon advertising that I definitely specialize in is like on-platform advertising. So for people specifically selling on the Amazon platform and then wanting to market their goods on that platform. But Amazon is definitely, they see Amazon advert as a whole like that service offering as a large path to growth for themselves and so with that they are starting to i think it's really smart on their part 
So they're like, okay, so we have our ad platform ads. We've been able to figure out a lot of those things. We've been able to vet a lot of our advertising capabilities through just like leveraging our own platform and first party data. But now there's actually been a branching out of um, them wanting to take that and then expand to other people who would like to leverage advertising, but don't necessarily want to uh, do it. They're not selling Amazon goods per se. And I do think it's really interesting. Of course, we're, we're at this point, if we're going to touch on that discussion, which I'm more than happy to do, I am stretching the level of maybe where I specifically at least work in day in and day out. But they are running out other ads. So for example, TV ads. And the thing that is very interesting about Amazon ad platform specifically is I have this focus on trying to make things a lot of, uh, or like very cheap entry level. For example, if you wanted to run a TV ad, thousands, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And if you were gonna talk back in the day, the amount of just the production that you would have to have, getting it up, the amount of ad spend that you would need to put into that, even being able to get a hold of somebody who's gonna be able to run that for you, it's really difficult. Where there are some options that are opening up, now again, specifically for people on the platform, there are other ways to get access to it as well, you can actually run a video ad for, I'm trying to remember the limited ad spend. It might even be like a couple hundred bucks. You can have access to syndicate your advertising on because Amazon has built, they're really what they've built is a distribution channel, which is really, really interesting. So distribution in terms of like physical products, as well as distribution of digital products. When you talk about like AWS or they have access to other domains or they're now very heavily playing in, you know, the video space, streaming video on demand and all of those things they're realizing in a lot of ways, this is something that I think a lot of us feel both Amazon sellers and advertisers alike, but it's how the story goes is advertising to them has really become a cash cow. So there's a lot of places in their business that they're working because they've been so heavily focused on growth. And there's been a lot of people looking at Amazon as a company saying like, I don't know how they could like the, the growth trajectory is insane. How do they keep these up, this up? And then it seems like almost without fail, time after time, when the numbers come out, you're like, oh my gosh, they grew even more, right? This is really, and it's like, it doesn't seem to be stopping. A lot of that growth came at the expense of profits, for sure. When you talk about distribution channels and then positioning for growth and, you know, just some sort of accelerated expansions that happen during COVID when, you know, they were the ones getting distribution out there already had those channels and there was like a massive force growth there, which like their capabilities have just expanded. And I think it's insane what they're doing. All of that takes immense amount of capital. And I'm not saying that advertising does not take capital to develop, but it's a software solution at the end of the day. And so that it has way more potential upside in terms of profits. And so I think you're seeing Amazon really starting to come into its own and saying, I feel like we can leverage what we already have. And the thing that is insanely interesting about Amazon itself, both on platform and now what they're doing off platform is they have consumer data and they have conversion data. That is insane, at least from my understanding, right? I'm going outside of my area of expertise here, but from my understanding, it's very difficult to one correlate when you're talking any other ad platform, really. Um, and especially if you're talking about sellers who are advertising products that are being sold on Amazon and they are advertising those products on the platform, that entire cycle, advertising, view to click to purchase, is first party data, which means there's a lot of really interesting calculations you can do and ways that you can look at data and be 100% certain that these ads are leading towards these sales and this growth and it's 100% one to one, the data is there, you can pull it, which I think makes it a really exciting platform as well as a very unique platform. You raise a very good point, which is that I think even a lot of people that sell on Amazon forget that Amazon has built and or acquired and then added onto 
significant media properties across from Amazon Video, which I'm a subscriber to as part of my Prime membership, to Twitch, to multiple other technologies and platforms out there in the market, they continue to hoover up media properties across the internet. And to them, really what this ultimately means is, sure, it helps to provide additional value to the Prime program, but it also provides additional placements for advertising. And so I mm -hmm. think what they realize is, geez, with us acquiring these other digital properties, sure, it's going to help us sell more Prime memberships, which are a cash cow in and of themselves. And it's going to keep people coming back to our platform to buy products. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, which is amazing. And of course, they clip the ticket on all those sales. And of course, they make a ton of money off the logistics back end behind, mm -hmm. obviously, FBA, et cetera. They, they basically turn every cost center within their business, over time, they turn them into a profit center. And they're very good at doing that. And logistics mm -hmm. started out as a cost center. Okay, let's externalize this. Let's make it a profit center. Okay, cool. It's going to cost us a lot to create content on the internet via Prime, etc. Cool. Let's turn that into a profit center and a value add for our Prime members, etc. So I think they've been very, very good at monetizing properties, technologies, I guess, and, and media. In the end, they are monetizing media at scale. And even if we think of somebody like Meta, if we, if we think of somebody like Google, sure, they've got certain platforms and technologies and Google has YouTube. But the reality is they haven't seemed so far, and heaven knows Google has tried. Google has tried to do e-commerce for a hell of a long time. And apart from Merchant Center and apart from some of the other things and apart from e-commerce advertising, of course, they haven't been able to crack the e-commerce nut. And neither has Meta. Meta has tried a lot for a long time too. They've tried to introduce shops and so many other initiatives to be able to actually buy and sell through their platforms. And apart from maybe Facebook Marketplace, which is, is a marketplace, they don't charge to sell in the marketplace. And I know why. They capture a lot of data through Marketplace for free. And But what I think Amazon has done really is they have effectively, by doing all of these media plays, They've just expanded the placement opportunities for their advertising. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it is really interesting. Again, I'm, I'm going to shift to talking about on-platform advertising for a second. With on-platform advertising, really, and honestly, the benefit of selling on Amazon itself is the fact that they have such great traffic. That's the thing that Amazon really gives you as an e-commerce seller is immense amount of traffic. And on-platform advertising is a little bit different than maybe some other like, mm, I would say Google pay-per-click would be a little bit more so along this vein is what you're looking to do is really harness that traffic and drive those eyeballs to your own product. But that's where, so that's what has made Amazon itself such a along with the distribution and all the other things has really made it, like you said, like almost an unavoidable platform to sell products on you know regardless if you're like intentionally putting a lot of efforts into it or you just put the products up on amazon i'll just have this as a potential distribution center if shoppers find us they're great we'll get those sales we're not looking to and say intentionally grow that part of our or that platform for as a distribution channel with that harnessing of all of that attention like you said amazon is buying up other like media channels or ways to get eyeballs while they have done that and they have done a very good job at expanding sort of their advertising capabilities and their distribution for ads they haven't really done a good job and i don't think anyone has on having a beautiful marriage between social media platforms and attention platforms and your sort of conversion platforms. So Amazon is very much a conversion platform, which is one of the re reasons why on-platform advertising works so, so well, because you are meeting people at the point of search. So if I go on and or you go on, you're shopping for your house, you're like, I need containers for moving or I need this thing, right? You're there to make a purchase. It is very, like we will go on there every once in a while like ah oh, gift for mom right there, there's always going to be that sort of browsing but by nature once a consumer goes to the platform they're already at the point of purchase yeah it's i'm not safe. going to amazon to be inspired or to mm -hmm. to shop or to window shop so to speak i'm going there because i have a need i know amazon can meet the need 
I'm going there to spend some money. Yeah, absolutely. Which is made, honestly, depending on the brand size, has really made the Amazon advertising uh, very attractive and almost a necessity for a lot of sellers because they're like, hey, people are coming here to purchase. It's very conversion driven eyeballs and so if i can get those eyeballs on my product providing the product doesn't suck i should make that conversion right and so uh, there's been this push for on-platform advertising to be very conversion focused and very roi focused because it can be also because you can directly correlate those rois and also do some really interesting calculations in say what is my spend versus total sales breakdowns where again other platforms it's really hard to get those conversion rate metrics and those sales metrics and directly 100 percent correlate those to the advertising efforts you can try but it's never going to be exact where again because all the data is first party data it's all contained in the one platform it's very easy to do those kind of calculations and also there is this very unique synergistic aspect of advertising and organic growth that happens on the ad, on Amazon platform. I don't ever see that going away because the way, I mean, we can get in the weeds on like their algorithm and why it makes the most sense for Amazon. But at the end of the day, like with Google ads, when there was that correlation of organic and advertising that actually didn't serve the Google ads platform and people were just like spamming ads and then the search got all terrible and it was like, it just didn't work in the favor of the platform. Where on Amazon, because the way that they have it set it up and because it is very conversion rate focused and because their goal is to serve up the best possible products for that particular shopper search, they can actually factor in advertising sales because at the end of the day, it is a sale. There is a positive consumer interaction. There is an indication that, hey, when someone searches this thing, they purchase this that's a positive correlation and so they can factor that into their organic and it's not going to hurt them because at the end of the day again that's what they're looking to is do people purchase this product yes let's so at higher in search so it's really fascinating now the thing that gets sticky is because there's so many people coming on the platform there's so many people the growth of the amazon platform is unignorable at this point and so there's a lot of brands that sort of begrudgingly realize like I need to sell here and there's a lot more more enterprise brands that have you know since neglected the platform because they're like it's five percent of my online retail sales like why are we pushing into this and then realizing oh this could be a really big player just because the platform is naturally growing so there's more people more consumers coming to the platform to purchase realizing that well maybe we should put more efforts here and then those ad dollars are now shifting to the platform which means all of the smaller sellers who had gotten those clicks for a lot cheaper than they used to. It's the name of the game. Any pay-per-click platform, everybody wants the costs go up. And yet you look at any other media platform, any other pay-per-click platform, the way it goes. It's like super cheap in the beginning. Nobody wants to use it. Everybody's a little bit weary. People get cheap clicks. They're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. More people jump on the bandwagon. Everything grows. It gets more costly because it's an auction, right? We have- Marketers ruin sellers. everything, right? We do, to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, they're small sellers that I'll consult with on, at times. And I understand their pain and frustration. And at the end of the day, I'm like, it is what it is. So it's, it doesn't serve you to complain about it as much as we all in our private rooms will complain about it when we're in, when we're actually having the conversation. But well, this, I guess this, this helps your business, right? In, in a way, because the more complex yeah. and difficult it is to win on Amazon, the more particularly new sellers need assistance and they need help because yes. a lot of what Amazon does is such a black box and there's so many mm -hmm. unknowns that you really need somebody that's been in the ecosystem for a while, somebody that's brand new to the ecosystem is, is really not going to know the history. They're not going to know the background. They're not going to. And, and I almost look at it as you wouldn't start a D2C brand today. You wouldn't start a D2C website on a Shopify today and expect SEO, for example, to be the sole source of traffic for your website. Yeah. You would automatically have the assumption that, yes, I'm going to need to do SEO and that's the, the long term play. But you would automatically have the assumption I'm going to need to spend some money on Google mm -hmm. ads. I'm going to need to spend some money on meta. I'm going to need to spend some money on some social media presence, some content, maybe even some influencer marketing. I, ha I have the expectation 
that even if I've got a yeah. DTC website, uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to drive 100% of my demand organically. It's just mm -hmm. never going to happen. And I think what you're saying is maybe back when you started out, and I don't know, I'd love your thoughts on this. When you first started out doing what you're doing, people could probably be quite successful on Amazon running no paid ads on Amazon. Mm -hmm. They could do it 100% organically. Nowadays, it feels like it's an almost must-have, particularly if you're a new brand to Amazon. Sure, you want to dominate the buy box. Sure, you want to get those, those four- and five-star ratings. Sure, you want to deliver on time. Sure, you want to use FBA. Sure, you want to have products spread around the country so you can fulfill quickly to your customers. Sure, you want to do all these things, and those are table stakes, but it feels like Amazon ads are almost a given for you to get traction on the platform, especially as a startup on the platform? I would say absolutely. And the reason for that is there's just much more options when it comes to the potential products that Amazon can display. And it's so it's much more competitive. And there also used to be a little bit, people always call them gray hat, but they were 100% against terms of service. So people used to do what they call like search find buys. Basically, you would have buyers who knew what they were like. People would get these clusters and they had all these Facebook groups and like, okay, go and type the search and then find my product and click. So it was basically simulating a legit purchase, but it was a legit purchase through it. It was this whole round of and everyone was like, everybody did it. Everybody knew it was a little bit not so great with shady scamming the algorithm and then when amazon was like oh, no we're bringing down the ban hammer like they basically were like we know where all the facebookers are and we've been like infiltrating and watching them and like they brought down the ban hammer i want to say it was about two years back and everybody's oh my gosh i can't believe it and everybody who was in the know was like yeah we always knew that this was like a ticking time bomb so they completely eliminated that so that used to be like the way to get the initial visibility you were still paying for it to be honest, I'm a little bit baffled when people are like, oh, I can't believe I have to spend an ads. But you used to like literally give away free products and pay people to go do it. Like at some point you were spending money. But so it's still, it still is when I list a product on Amazon, how are people finding it, right? Now, if you have a very large brand that you have the brand recognition and shoppers are already going into Amazon and typing in that specific brand and looking for a product, Congratulations, just list it, you don't need ads. But you've paid for advertising, you've paid for that in some way or another, either through blood, sweat, and tears of building your brand and that recognition, or through other advertising dollars and other platforms, or you have the you have begged, borrowed, paid Stole. for those eyeballs at some point somewhere, right? If you're a you Nike, if you're a Weber, if you're whoever it might be, like right. there's a lot of products that I went directly to Amazon. Uh, there was a lot of products that I went there and I searched by brand because I knew that mm -hmm. I was like my barbecue. I wanted a Weber barbecue. I didn't want any other barbecue. So, of course, I'm searching for Weber and I'm searching for the model number. Weber as a seller, as a direct seller on Amazon, they're the first ones that come up. And I bought directly through Weber directly, right? But as you say, they've spent 100 years or 80 years or however long it's been building their brand building their product, building demand for their product elsewhere off Amazon. So now they get to reap the rewards. And I can't see a reason why if 95% of their sales come from branded search on Amazon, I can't see a reason for them to necessarily run Amazon ads unless they have a whole lot of competitors like their dealers and distributors selling mm -hmm. against them on the platform than maybe they'd want to and capture that demand at top of funnel there. But the reality is that probably half of my queries have been non-branded queries. They've been product-related mm -hmm. queries as opposed to brand related queries. And I feel like that's where you're saying, that's where the scrap comes in. That's where the, that's where the mm -hmm. battle for the eyeballs, that's where the battle for the buy box comes in. It's all those non-branded searches that are product or category specific. That's where you need to spend some coin if you wanna win. Yeah, absolutely. And for a brand like Weber, they may just say, hey, I'm perfectly fine with the brand show that I have, right? I see Amazon as a side distribution channel. We benefit from it. We're not intentionally spending ad dollars here. We're okay with this. There are some larger enterprise brands that we've since worked at. They have great recognition. They have amazing branded search. They're nationally recognized brands. However, when it comes to Amazon specific search, and like you said, those non-branded searches, they have little to no visibility. So there they're like, okay, we see Amazon. It's been a great distribution channel for us. How can we gain more from it? We already have that distribution running. We already have everything up. The assets are all there. 
let's work to get more and that's where you know they're testing it which by the way enterprise test budget makes entry-level sellers gasp right that's the kind of money that's being funneled into the platform when they say hey we're gonna test it they're throwing a couple hundred thousand dollars at it right that's their test budget depending on the size of the brand and all that right um but that's the kind of money that all of a sudden is getting injected into ads and that's the kind of money that a lot of smaller sellers are having to come up against and that's where you get your scrappy but the good news is as difficult as that is and as competitive as that is and as crazy as that game is getting like the cost per clicks i've seen now seven years ago i would have absolutely guessed right how who is paying for this somebody is right it's an auction but if you have a better mousetrap being a product if you inherently concern about your consumers not hey i'm just gonna put up something that everybody else has on the market and I'm gonna hope that I can do better through grunt work, just banging my head against the wall in terms of throwing ad dollars at it, right? That's not the way to go about it. But if you have a product that the market legitimately wants, that is something that converts really well, um, and you have vetted that there is an actual search market for it on Amazon, right? We're talking Amazon advertising, we're talking about garnering that traffic. You don't create traffic, the amazon platform itself again due to the nature that it's not the social platform people are going there to purchase it's a very consumer driven platform so you're harnessing that consumer demand that already exists on the platform to be honest like i've had some brands are like oh we have this innovative product we want to bring it to amazon i'm like great amazon is a great distribution channel because you get you get the warehousing you get the shipping you get again the transaction there's so many things that amazon brings to the table depending on what the product is that may or may not be demand so that's something you really want to vet before you start selling products i'm not saying it's not a good transaction channel but if you're only going to rely on amazon to bring that demand make sure that demand already exists is what i would say providing you're tapping into a demand source and you get your eyeballs in front of that demand great like you have the potential to out of your backyard i mean because like right yes you're gonna have to ship the products you're gonna have to ship them into fba there's logistics but you don't have to worry about warehousing you don't have to worry about the transactions you have some level of customer service but not all that much you would be amazed at the brands that i talk to doing millions of dollars a year in sales and they have two people on their team or it's a husband and wife team old school e-com channels the amount of like distribution and sales that you can rack up with just a handful of products and maybe one or two overseas vas it's insane so that's the power of the platform but yes the game is getting harder because there's more people recognizing that this is where the action is at. And if you're not building the better mousetrap, it, it, is, it's, it is an uphill battle. And do you think that if we were to compare, because obviously you've been doing this for a very long time, right? You've been doing this for, what, seven years? So the reality is you've probably seen a lot of changes in Amazon over this time. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen a lot of changes in the brands that find success versus don't find success on Amazon. Amazon, to me, feels like a black box, and it feels, geez, you put one foot wrong, and you can be banned from the platform. You put one foot wrong, you don't deliver, and you can lose your Prime badge, and there's all sorts. Of, it, fe it just feels like it's a minefield. Even if you want to do everything right by Amazon standards, you want to you basically want to live by all the rules and regulations that they have and mm -hmm. you want to be you want to be a top Amazon seller, sometimes it feels like that's hard to achieve even if that's your goal. And the other thing mm -hmm. that I find really I, I think it aligns with what you said, but I'd love to get your thoughts on this. You gotta have a good product. Because I tell you, when I go now and I search, there's two filters I automatically apply after every single search I do. Because I'm a Prime member, I tick the Prime filter, and then I go down to the star rating and I do four plus. I will not buy, I will not even consider a product that has less than four stars. In fact, I prefer, I would love it, and I don't know why Amazon doesn't do this, they only allow you to do it by whole star filters. Mm. I would love to say, actually, only show me things that are 4.5 or 4.7 or uh, stars or above. Because I tell you, when you go in and you start looking at the feedback on anything lower than four stars, the feedback is 
terrible. Yeah. It is bad, right? And, and I, as I go down through and I'm looking through after I filter by prime and I filter by four stars, I then go down the list and I literally hover over the stars. And basically, I will not cons personally, I will not consider anything that doesn't have at least 4.5 stars. And I can't imagine that I'm alone in this. I can't imagine that I'm the only person that looks for things that are rated very highly, and then I'll actually go in, if it's 4.5 or above, then I'll go in, and I'll read some of the positive reviews, and I'll read some of the negative mm -hmm. reviews. I'll read some of the one-star reviews, and I'll read some of the five-star reviews, and try to get a handle on, okay, what are the parts of this product that maybe aren't great? What are the things that are amazing about this product so that I can make a fully informed purchasing decision? But it feels like you can do all the work in the world. You can have a great listing. You can have lots of product information. You might even have multiple languages. You might have a great price. You might ha be running advertising. You might be right at the top of the search results. But man, if your product is crappy, you're never gonna. You're just not gonna win on Amazon, no matter how much money you spend, right? Yeah, no, I, I would say that is true for just about any purchase, regardless of industry and. Again, it is one of those things, there there are a lot of, say, I don't want to say smaller sellers, but small in terms of team, right? Small in terms of the scale of their operations, right? Who will come into, and because Amazon is the only distribution and e-com channel that they know, sometimes we can get a little bit lost in our own world, right? But there are good business principles and practices that irregardless of industry or market or whatever it is are true. That is things like customer attention, right? Customer feedback, a good product. That goes if it's a service, that goes if it's, you know, like a physical product, if it is a digital product. People in software should be intently looking at, okay, how do people use this product? Where do they like it? Where do they don't like it? How can we tweak it? How do we make sure retention? Are they coming and using the product for a month and then leaving? That's not good for business, right? Same exact thing for physical products on Amazon. And so if you are not intent on making sure that product is good, you will not survive the wave of incoming competition. You just won't. I myself as an agency, right? If we tomorrow don't care about our clients and we stop answering their emails immediately and if we stop actually doing the things that we want to do, I will cease to be in business probably in about three months. Hopefully it may be longer than that. Maybe I have enough reputation to scale me through that. So I don't care what sort of, what product or distribution channel or anything. And sometimes, and I get it, Right? Because as a business owner, we're here, we're like, oh my gosh, the potential is insane. Like, I just want to hit those seven figure dollars. Like, I want to scale to the moon. I want to have five products, each doing hundreds of thousand dollars a year. It's possible. I will tell you right now, that is possible. I have seen single products pulling hundreds of thousands a month. It is possible. It's not easy. And you don't get there overnight. And you don't get there without intention. So if you come to the platform with intention, knowing that maybe this is a learning curve for me and maybe that first product doesn't quite hit. I've talked to the seller, unfortunately, like newer people to the game and they're like, oh, the first product didn't hit, Amazon doesn't work. No, the product did. Look at it, right? If there's someone on the platform doing something, it means it's achievable. So it is achievable. But like you said, there, there is a learning curve as small as you can run it on a team because you're leveraging Amazon's distribution and capabilities. Like you said, there's a lot of moving people. Like, where do you even log in to answer like customer support tickets? How do you list products on Amazon? How, what are the regulations in this category versus that category? There's lots of learning that has to be done. There are ways to shortcut that learning in terms of looking at content there, listening to podcasts like yours, joining courses, getting a mentor, right? There's options out there, just like any business, right? If I'm trying to learn something, I want to get better at sales. I'm going to go hire, I'm going to go look at a course. I'm going to get a sales mentor. I'm going to watch YouTube, right? Same thing with Amazon. The one thing I will say that I love about the Amazon community in general, and again, it is something that I know I am 
very knee deep in this community so sometimes i lack context but the context i've heard from others who are in other industries is there is this amazing unique thing about the amazon seller community that they are very open and generous with their information up to the point they will not tell you their products. And to be honest, I don't blame them because product sourcing is one of the most hard, that's the hardest things to get. So unless they have a massive mode around them in terms of like branding or patents or something that you know allows them with confidence to share, don't ask, especially a private label seller, do not ask them their product, they will get offended. But if they find a new option, if they find a way to do something, if they're like, oh my gosh, here's this like new cool hack for this, they'll probably start talking about it. Maybe not publicly on YouTube, but in seller communities and things. It is a very generous community. So you can leverage that to your advantage, which is amazing. I've seen that even on Reddit, that people yeah. are pretty, pretty pretty open and transparent on Reddit about what works and what doesn't work on Amazon mm-hmm. today. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of things that can be learned, but like, I think it's like any business. It's like you have to commit to it, Yeah. right? You got to commit to it and commit to do it right and know that, in the beginning, you might not get it right. It's not that the platform itself doesn't work. Is that how you went about it or that specific thing didn't work? And sometimes that's really hard to stomach as a business owner because the thing with selling on Amazon is it is a physical product, which means that you have you know, sourcing costs and things that are associated. So you know, if you get into freelancing and stick something off Fiverr and it doesn't work, okay so you're out what time if you try and sell a physical product and it doesn't work then you're out all that you know all that inventory costs which can be a little bit gnarly sometimes and do you think that for people that are coming to amazon for the very first time and they're just they're effectively a startup on amazon um do you think that in, in order for them to really get traction on the platform they need to do some form of advertising and it also feels like Advertising also can drive demand in specific regions where you might not have demand today. And then the algorithm, especially for FBA, starts to work better because now, okay, cool, I'm driving demand in a specific region or a specific time of the year or whatever it might be. And it can help the FBA algorithm work better in terms of being able to allocate product between specific warehouses and locations so product gets to your customers faster, etc. It feels like Amazon advertising is a little bit of a growth hack beyond just the immediate sales and driving immediate sales, that it helps the Amazon algorithm work better across your entire range of products. It helps the Amazon algorithm work better across your your store, so to speak, your brand on Amazon. And it feels, help me understand better what types of advertising I can do on Amazon. Is it just, does it just push my listings to the top? Does it, can I, I know, for example, in the meta world, creative is everything like it, you you mm-hmm. can run the best ad in the world but if the creative is crap it's not going to perform well right in the google world the creative is less important because it's a usually a text ad right and as mm-hmm. a result of that the creative doesn't impact usually performance very much but the text of the ad does the targeting of the ad does the keyword targeting certainly does the negative keywords certainly does the geo targeting certainly does so there's lots of optimizations you could do in the google world what does ad optimization look like in the Amazon world. Yeah, so in a lot of ways it's much simpler, which is good news for new sellers. We talked about creatives. Creatives on in Amazon advertising, they are, Amazon is rolling out more options. There's definitely more options. There used to be even two years ago. In some ways they're behind. So there is no actual geo-targeting as of yet. Maybe you'll talk to me in months or something, they'll roll it out, right? As of right now, there's no real geo, which to your point about like distribution channels and all the coordinations of that, I would love to have geo-targeting options. I think that would significantly improve a lot of our ad performance. It also drives me up a wall when I have to deal with it. That's for me to, do. that's for future me to have to figure out. So there, there are some lack of capabilities that is a little bit surprising sometimes. So for example, there is no capabilities of making adjustments depending on the device, which is a little bit interesting. One would think, right? They actually rolled out some very interesting. So sometimes they'll roll out metrics that were like, oh, cool, we can see what's happening, right? Like I can look at where my geo performance is best. I can't do anything about it on the ad side. So it's like quite frustrating. Like I can actually look at where your traffic is coming from versus device. I can't take action on it yet. I can't imagine that's not something that they wouldn't want to adjust for. But again, that's 
also going to be a pain for me, which is also going to give me job security, right? <laughs> so for future, Elizabeth, to have to figure out. When you're talking about what are the ad capabilities, yes, there are certain ads where there is a creative involved, which is either called sponsored brand ads. And there is an option, you've probably seen this when you're searching, right? A video ad in the middle of search. So that's an ad right? Then you have the option to run those video ads. However, the largest ad type, also the one that we have noticed the largest correlation between pushing you up in organic search and advertising efforts is something called sponsored products. The thing with sponsored products is there is no creatives involved other than whatever creatives have gone into your listing, meaning the listing has to not suck. Um, the thing about, <laughs> yeah, Going back to all the things Easy, that you easier said, like, said than done, right? I've saw, I've seen a lot I've done. seen a lot of listings that are pretty crap. Yes, much easier said than done. I'm not saying it's easy, but it, they also are the ones that look the most native. It's very easy unless you're intimately familiar with the ads and where they show up and the platform and know how to look for that little tiny gray sponsored a tag on it. They look very native. They show up pretty much in the search grids and also on the product pages and stuff. The thing to run with that is you can run them for very minimal ad budgets. Again, the creatives, it's not, it's the listing, right? That should be a prerequisite for selling on the ad platform. Think of your listings as, this is, again, it's funny to me. I see a lot of new sellers are like, oh, I just get it up, right? I just want to get the listing up. I'm like, would you set up a Shopify store with a terrible website? You know, like old school HTML and flash and like it just, ha, ah, just get it up, right? And no images, one sentence description, but no product right. variants. It's, you think, I always view listings as like landing pages, right? That is your landing page. Well, they page are a landing in, page. That's yeah. exactly what they are. Because oftentimes if I do a Google search, they're going to take me directly to a product mm -hmm. page on Amazon. And is your landing page sufficient to be able to convert traffic? The good news is though that Amazon has very clearly defined what can or cannot be in a listing. So you do have a box that, the sandbox you have to play in, which means that everybody else has to play in the sandbox, right? But there's a big difference oh. between one crappy image and 10 images that are amazing yes. and have the specs embedded in the image, have measurements embedded in the image, are high quality, produ high production quality videos, high production quality text and description and attributes. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. Sure, you all, we all have to still play within the Amazon box, but there's a massive difference between high production value images and videos, low production quality, and high production value content and low production value content. There's such a massive difference between those two. And it's night and day when you land on two different pages, sometimes even for the exact same product. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're clearly the same product. And one product detail page is just rubbish and it's got almost nothing. Yeah. And then the other one is highly detailed zoom images, macro images, just beautiful production quality. And to your point, I think what's the point? It's almost like, why would I spend money with Meta or Google to drive traffic to a crappy Shopify website? It's the same thing on Amazon. Why would I spend all this money in ads to drive traffic to a crappy product page when they land there? Absolutely. And also the thing that I, Amazon goes through phases where they, it seems like there's an internal focus to improve something or to give sellers more options. For a while, it was a real focus on being able to get more options for brands. Because that's been like a distinct, that's been a lot of complaints from brands who feel like they've built a brand, they own a brand, they're like, why should I sell on the platform? I can't tell my brand story. I have limited access to, yeah, you can have your brand guide and make your listings according to the brand guide, but there's only so much you can do with that, right? So Still looks like an Amazon really page, come on. It does, and it always will, honestly, because yeah. it is their platform, it is their shoppers, they have they own that, and they've built that. At some point, it's always going to have to be within their sandbox, but they started doing, getting much more options for, say, A-plus content, expanding that so you can have those sort of those beautiful descriptions down in the listing. They did able to do posts, which is interesting. You can now follow brands, more options for brand source, trying to get more data for brands, a lot of things like that. Then they had an interesting wave where they started rolling out more data capabilities and insights that we'd never seen before. Some of those was answers to questions. So sellers all the time. I'm sure in every industry, right? They're like, okay, maybe I'm doing good. I feel, I get this all the time. Like, I feel like I'm doing good. I think I'm doing good. But like, how do I get that information? Do, am I doing good? I don't know, right? And so, if you've got no benchmarks, how do you know? 
Right. And no one did for the longest time. Like, there was third-party tools scraping things. You could, but everybody was like, it's third-party data, and Amazon does not reveal that to anybody. Like, how accurate is that? Is this really? Like, we don't know. They had this, like, like rollout after rollout of first-party data surrounding um, other brands, other products on Amazon. So now when someone says, hey, how am I doing? You say, oh, go look at this report. Here's how you stack up. Are you good or are you not? Which has been amazing. Again, because it's all contained within the same platform. It's first party data. You can be very confident in the information that it's giving you. And that allows you to go, okay, I'm not. So here's the interesting thing. One of the things that they rolled out is called search query performance report. They will actually give you individual ASIN level performance data compared on a individual shopper search query you can say how much of the market share am i getting on this specific search query what is my conversion rate what is my purchase rate from that you can calculate click-through rates all of this thing so you say i'm trying to gain market share here i don't have great conversion rate and click-through rate maybe that's something else that i can take action on so That has been really, I think, game changer for those sellers who are actually using it, which then allows you to roll that back into ads. So that's where, like you were saying, it's getting more competitive, (laughs) why I continue to maintain my job, and I think we'll still, because it's just getting more complicated. With it being more and more competitive, it it used to be you just throw ad dollars at it, right? When you got clicks at 10 cents a click, doesn't matter the conversion rate, right? I can get 100 clicks, and I'm still making bank when I convert, right? Nowadays, if you're pushing up 2 to $8 a click in some categories, supplements, forget about it. You're looking at $25 a click. It's bananas. Um, I saw a $78 click a little while, right? I'm not saying everybody's running that. I'm saying I saw it. I was in the account. You better have um, a bloody high converting product page then. Oh, no, that one was straight up wasted ad spend. I was like, why was this here? It was not an account that we ran. We took it over and we fixed it. But if you don't watch things can get out of control nowadays so it's it's not so much how to run it right because if you're talking amazon advertising it's all right how do we get the eyeballs to my product if i'm doing a little bit better it's how do we get the right eyeballs to my product so that was maybe a couple years ago now it's how do i get the right eyeballs to my product at a price that i can afford where it makes sense and i can compete and those last two steps are the things that if you want to run it without having to completely give up any and all profitability, that's what you need to figure out is where can I afford it and where can I compete on it? And then if I put my ad dollars there, then I can have my cake and eat it too in terms of growing sales and growing profits. Difficult. Wow. And is that an area yeah. that you help brands do the math and do the strategy? Because obviously... I'm guessing if you list 50,000 products on Amazon, which I'm sure some sellers do, especially if they're a drop shipper or whatever it might be, then they're surely not going to run paid advertising across their entire catalog. They're going to they're going to maybe run paid ads across the top 10% of their product set or something like that. Presumably there's some strategy around which products make great candidates for paid ads and which products don't make great candidates for paid ads. Yeah, and we do have some large sellers that in some form or fashion run it across their entire catalog. But also for context, we manage brand or manage ads for quite a few large clothing sellers. What if you talk about catalog skies and skew count and hundreds of variations per listing? Like, it's the kind of thing when I tell other advertisers or people like, oh yeah, we run ads for clothing brands. They're like, oh, (laughs) yeah. So we basically went through a trial by fire five, six years ago. Um, and figured out a lot of those headaches before things got as gnarly as they are today. So that has consequently shaped a lot of our views around how do you figure out the 80-20, what do you do with the bottom end of the catalog, how do I figure out where the ad dollars are going to be most effective. Because if I had, I always have one, I was like, you give me one product, that's going to be the most dang optimized product you've ever seen in your life, right? Incremental, great. And this is actually my struggle with a lot of people putting out information in the market, right? It's not that it's not 
bad information, but my question is always, how can I do things at scale without giving up efficiencies? That's my entire focus as an agency owner, and I think it will continue to be my entire focus, right? Because I don't want to get ever completely 100% 80 20 it because you got an 80 percent there that a lot of sellers are looking at and say like i feel like there's a gold nugget within the 80 i just don't know how to find it and i don't know i don't know how to find it without immense amounts of costly ad tests either so like how do i figure that out so it's, it's trying to figure out at scale how can it be efficient and effective with that 80 percent while not ignoring the 20 percent and then also constantly adjusting for say new product launches. And like when you start talking about it, it can become this very complex beast. So there's a lot of information put out. I was just talking about like, oh, search query performance report is amazing. And you can take one very specific ASIN and like figure out all of these things. That's amazing. And I've seen some crazy dashboards and some great information on it. That's for one product. What happens when that's clothing and you have a hundred different variations on that listing and all of those variations have a thousand different keywords associated with them. At that point, if I do that analysis, which might take me a couple hours and then I poke my head up and say, I got a hundred other variations to do it on a product catalog with like 20,000 SKUs, was my time best spent doing that? Probably not. And where we've actually started to like really shift our focus and train the team is on is the analytics portion of it. Because the nuts and bolts and the things that need to change and how to do things best, at the end of the day, it's gotten more difficult, but the actual actions are, do I spend more or do I spend less on this thing? That's most advertising it's that do i put more efforts here do i put less efforts here do i put more ad spend here do i put less ad spend so it's figuring out a more scalable and sophisticated way to determine where is that ad spend best allocated and how do i look at the macro and then immediately as quickly as possible zoom into the micro where I, because the micro is where we take actions, the macro actions. So how do I look at the macro, quickly get to the micro and be certain that is the micro step that is going to impact the macro the biggest. And I think it sounds really simple when I say it like that, it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can fully understand that. And it, are Amazon ads pay per click or are they pay mm -hmm. for display? Pay-per-click, they are ruling out pay for display more. They have a couple ad models, which is funny. In, in a typical world, pay per impression, pay per display, right? That's very common ad model. On Amazon, it's not. And so this is this very old school, scrappy, conversion focused, ROI driven profitability that is still very present with a lot of sellers. Rightfully so. When you're talking about either you're getting funding or you're fueling the business from your own from your own cash flow you never really should ever step away from looking at your bottom line right mm -hmm. you need to make sure you stay in business so there's that very scrappy aspect of it which to be honest i think those are my favorite sellers to work with because you can be creative you can move fast you can figure out the out of the box strategies and they're like they're chomping at the bit for you to give them something to roll with it's my favorite to work with and honestly, who I'm trying to optimize my agency for. So with those sellers, there is an inherent pros and cons, right? There's this inherent distrust when Amazon says brand awareness or pay per impression, they're like equals wasted ad spend. Now, I don't think that's necessarily true. There is some ways where we've been able to get data that we can actually look at. So obviously the spend is on a pay per impression model, but because it's still the transactions are still happening within the platform, you can actually look at the conversion rate metrics on a cost per click model. And that's how we've been able to manage that sort of ad type and say, okay, we recognize that we're spending per impression, but when we're looking at our optimization efforts and just the performance of it, we'll evaluate it on a, a click conversion model. Makes complete sense. Wow, what a wild world. This, this Amazon ad world sounds a little crazy. It sounds a lot of fun. And it sounds like a huge amount of opportunity for merchants. Now, look, this an hour has nearly flown by. It's been a fantastic conversation. I've learned a ton about a topic that I knew so little about when we started. So I appreciate you sharing with me and my audience about all things 
Google advertising. Now, as we come down to the end of our time together, this is where I get to flip the script. I get to hand the microphone over to you. I get to let you ask me one question, any question you like. It can be personal or wow, professional. Goodness. Elizabeth Green from... And I'm, I'm, I know I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna say your name wrong. Jungler. No, that was, yeah, no, that was correct. Okay, cool. What is your question for me today? Should have prepared for this one. I got one, one. Better make it good. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Out of personal curiosity, you had mentioned Google Ads directing to Amazon listings. Is that something that you consult on, have dabbled in? And what's, if so, I'd be curious to hear your experience there. Consult on mm. marketing services. I don't deliver marketing services. Mine, my consulting is, first of all, 8% B2B focused. So it's businesses selling Very to cool. businesses via e-commerce. I used to play heavily in the D2C and B2C world, but over the last five plus years, I've really doubled down on the B2B world because I love it. But I also focus on the tech and ops side of e-commerce and solution architecture, full stack solution architecture, system integration, et cetera, not so much on the advertising side, except for where we need to integrate e-commerce platforms or backend technologies in with channels like Amazon. Obviously, that's a space that I play. I think to me, anything that, especially if you're an Amazon only brand, then obviously, why wouldn't you want to advertise absolutely everywhere? Meta, Google, freaking Reddit, wherever it might be. If you're a single channel seller, and there's lots of Amazon born native brands that don't have a direct to consumer e-commerce website, why wouldn't I want to use every single tool in my tool belt to be able to get traffic to my listings on Amazon. And if that means it's a Google ad, if that means it's a meta ad, if that means it's a Reddit ad, if that means it's organic content, if it's organic social, whatever it might be, I don't see a reason. You just, you have to treat it like almost a standalone business on Amazon. You have to treat it that way and you have to give it that much attention and love and I guess input that why wouldn't you leverage every single opportunity you can to get as much traffic as you possibly can directly to your listings instead of driving traffic to Amazon search. No, I want to drive it directly and, and I want my Amazon listing to be my freaking landing page, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I know that there are certain limitations within Google ads about where you can land people on an mm -hmm. ad from an ad, but I think you got to take every single opportunity you can. And there's plenty of D to C websites that actually push people to execute the transaction on Amazon, right? And that makes sense, right? If their entire infrastructure is, is around Amazon and if it's all around FBA and they're putting most of their effort into the Amazon channel, but they just have a D2C channel. And what I'm seeing more and more is brands establishing a D2C channel just to have an easier integration with Amazon. Mm -hmm. Because there's an out-of-the-box integration, for example, between Shopify and Amazon to push your listings. You have a, a place where you can easily load up all your content and your images and where you can do all your order management and pull your orders back down into that platform for fulfillment, especially if you're running your own fulfillment services. And I'm seeing more and more brands establish a D2C channel purely as a home on the internet that people can search and find, but more importantly, so that they have an integration jumping off point for all these other digital channels that they need to push their catalog to. And it's easier if you don't have a PIM system, for example, and effectively Shopify is your PIM system, then you're going to do all your enrichment, you're going to do all your product uploads, you're going to do all the pricing, you're going to do all that stuff directly in Shopify. Cool. Now I don't want to have to recreate that manually in Amazon. I'm just going to connect the two up and I'm going to push all my listings out and I'm going to push my inventory account out and all that sort of stuff. Cool. I'll in integrate Shopify once with my ERP or my accounting system where I'm ever holding my inventory. I'll update Shopify and then it will update all of my other selling channels, including Amazon. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot more of that too, where they're using their e-commerce platform as more of a middleware platform than a direct selling platform. And this yeah. is becoming very common as well. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting parting thing on that. Amazon's become very much aware of that. So they've rolled out uh, a feature what they call Buy With Prime. So it's a way for you to integrate. Yep. They essentially act as your warehousing. And then, which again, some brands are like happy with that. Some brands are like, it's my own D2C. Why does Amazon need a piece of it? Again, it's, it's pros and cons, right? Absolutely. Listen, it's been a fantastic conversation. Elizabeth, if people want to get a hold of you and they want to speak with you about Amazon advertising, I'll put your LinkedIn link in the show notes. I'll also put 
the jungler link in the show notes. But other than that, how do you like people to get a hold of you and have a chat about all things Amazon advertising? No, those would be the best channels. If you just want to straight up get on a call with me, I'm still taking those. So I would go to our website. There should be a calendar link at the bottom. Book a call. Let's chat. But yeah, if you want to follow me on a social platform, LinkedIn is typically where I put out the most content. I try and do my best to be an educational voice in this space. So. If you'd like to get mentored by Jason for free, head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click Get Mentored by Jason.